America is a happy country, despite everything. Yeah, not so much anymore. Democrats continue to erode our economic freedoms, and Republicans happily rescind our individual liberties. Not to get into the whole Will McAvoy newsroom speech. Why is America not the greatest, greatest country in the world, Professor? That's my answer. You're saying yes. You're America has traded in its star spangled banner for ones with elephants, donkeys, cues, and rainbows. That beautiful but gaudy flag used to take precedent. Now, not so much. Partisanship has always been a plague on this nation. George Washington even warned of the dangers of factions. But recently, it has become even more alarming. And more people today than possibly ever before associate their party's prerogatives as the American standard. Hey man, that's not cool. Ostracizing those with different ideologies, viewing dissenters as second-class citizens, and unapologetically advocate for their party's complete dominion over this nation. The bases of each party are racing to the fringes, leaving a major portion of the population disenfranchised. Because despite the growing entrenched political nature of the party's bases, most Americans still reside somewhere near the center. And it's we the people, not we the party, that need to make a stand. You're goddamn right. America is sinking, and it's up to us to right the ship. It won't happen with the current political duopoly. In fact, it might be time to address some sweeping changes that need to happen in America. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? This isn't a foreign or drastic concept either. Thomas Jefferson advocated that our Constitution, the same one many hold so sacredly, should be revisited, revised, and re-implemented every 19 years. Jefferson did not want the desires of past generations to shackle the future. Because much to the dismay of modern conservative perspective, our founders exemplified classical liberalism. Boom! Their intent was to allow for a growing constitution, which is why amendments are vital to that document. And with the average age of Congress around 60, it's time for the next youth revolution. Because for the boomers, the future is now ours, and even those younger than me. How do you do, fellow kids? It's been decades of continued policy, rhetoric, virtue signaling, and division by that generation that has led us to this moment. It's not the aspirations of younger generations that are cause for the deterioration and division of this nation. It's the restraint and disconnect from older generations to acknowledge that America is always in flux. It has been continuously changing from the start, and it will continue to change long after we're dead. So, if we take up Jefferson's challenge, I accept that challenge, and breathe life into a more reflective representation of government without compromising the American intent of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, what could we do? First, and most importantly, term limits. Please institute some goddamn term limits. The problem with this is, you have too many people in Congress now that would not want to relinquish power. Looking at you, McConnell and Pelosi. They like to play on the vital nature of the duopoly to preserve the nation with their party and are content with being entrenched. And that means term limits across the board. House, Senate, Supreme Court. And it doesn't have to be a serve and done limit either. There are some good representatives out there, but at the very least restrict multiple successive terms. Keep a limit to two consecutive terms within the same body of Congress. After they've served those two terms, they can either run for office in another chamber 
or allow one term to pass before seeking election again. This keeps fresh representation and puts a hamper on corruption without sacrificing the argument for sustained experience within government. However, the Supreme Court should only be held to one term and no more lifelong appointments. Their term should mirror Thomas Jefferson's recognition of generational change and be limited to 19 years so that those on the bench have a better pulse of the nation. And let's stay with SCOTUS. To the conservatives, the recent decisions in 2022 have been a resounding victory, but it has not been a victory for the nation. The pure partisan alignment of these rulings, the direct threats to individual liberty addressed within those decisions, right to jail. the breach of trust of justices who lied under oath during their confirmation hearings, the manipulative way the Republican Party positioned to gain the majority made that nomination and you could use my words against me and you'd be absolutely right. All bring into question the legitimacy of this bench. So, with all of that said, let's expand the court. Are you mad? <laughs> you completely lost your mind. Sure. Wow, it is amazing how crazy I really am. Sounds like a liberal attempt to pack the court. But let's be honest. The court does not represent the majority of Americans. In fact, three of the current justices were appointed by a president that lost the popular vote. And I'm not talking about 2020, because Trump also lost the popular vote in 2016. <laughs> Man, you are one pathetic loser. <laughs> the number of justices have fluctuated throughout our history, so this is also nothing new. But Let's set the number of justices to 12, matching regional circuits. Dems obviously would want that 13th seat to align with the 13 appellate courts and gain an advantage, but I'm okay with an even number bench and the possibility of a deadlock. That drives better consideration of a ruling. And if that were implemented now with appointments by Biden, the court would have no clear majority. We need to end SCOTUS's abuse of the shadow docket as well. It's meant to be used in emergency cases, but has been used to hide during normal proceedings while considering vital cases. Transparency should always be the standard of government. And finally with SCOTUS, establish a code of ethics for justices. There currently is not one and they have the least amount of accountability than any other representative that serves this nation. Why am I so hard on SCOTUS? Haters gonna hate, and haters gonna hate. Well, under ambiguity, they unconstitutionally granted themselves the power of judicial review, and we've been content with that tyranny for over 230 years. Thank you, sir, may I have another? Okay enough roasting SCOTUS. Let's give the president more power. Yep, you heard that right. And no, I'm not singling out President Biden. Anytime you consider granting more authority to any branch, especially the executive, we must consider if we'd be content with the opposing party wielding that same control. But line item veto wouldn't be a bad thing. With pork barrel spending back on the table, Presidents should have limited line item veto authority to weed out excessive earmarks. Again, limited and time constrained. Next would be our voting system, which is broke and outdated. Now, I'm not just referring to the Electoral College, and I'm not necessarily advocating for the abolishment of it either, but it definitely needs to be addressed because it does marginalize voters. Ranked choice voting is gaining popularity within states for state elections. Alaska and Maine are the only two states that use it for federal elections. Instituting that throughout would encourage multiple party candidates, not just the big two. It would cast a larger approval for the winning candidates as well. And finally, distribute electoral votes according to the candidate's percentage received. 
No more winner takes all by states. Currently, Maine and Nebraska have a similar distribution system. This suddenly makes every state important during a general election. Campaigning would no longer be isolated to a handful of swing states. These are but a few. And to be honest, there are so many changes and updates that need to occur. And none of which would undermine the American spirit. Things like ending filibusters, stop gerrymandering, strong ethical restrictions on special interests, PAC funding, excessive government oversight, trade and tariffs, taxes, the list goes on. Our Constitution was written during an agrarian society of 4 million people stretched across thousands of miles. That is not reflective of the complexities we face today. And as this nation recognized the expansion of individual liberties by ending slavery, expanding voting access to women, recognizing citizenship for Native Americans and Asian Americans, and granting LGBTQ the same rights we all cherish, we continue to grow and change. And for the most part, for the better. It's time our governing documents reflect our society. The goal would be to maximize and protect all individual liberties, stifle partisanship, rein in a growing government, and for younger generations to take responsibility in guiding this nation. Thomas Jefferson wanted it. Even James Madison was a fan of rewriting the Constitution to reflect changes, as to not cause confusion with antiquated text, instead of our current method of adding appendages and amendments. This country was conceived in liberty, and founded as a social experiment in self-governance. No matter the divisive differences in ideology, we are still a united nation. And as Lincoln said, a house divided cannot stand. That doesn't mean divorce is imminent or even warranted. Instead of a continued struggle to impose one party's dominance over the other, which leaves many Americans disenfranchised, it is up to us to embrace inclusivity and forge a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish under the threat of partisanship.